Hello everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week we're coming at you with two brand new reviews for two brand new records. Two big records this week. We're going to be talking about the newest album from The National, the second album in 2023 that they have released the follow-up to the first two pages of frankenstein we covered that album we covered their whole discography in a retrospective last year ago watch those if you haven't catch up to where we are today and we're also gonna be talking about the latest album from singer songwriter and indie rock legend i guess at this point mitski new album the land is inhospitable and so are we so Yes, let's talk about Mitski first. Let's lead off with this album, which has quickly become one of the year's most rapturously received records. Despite a fairly underplayed rollout, Mitski announced that she was recording a new album in Nashville just a couple of months before that we the record arrived. I think we had we had Bud, Bug Like an Angel. We might have had a second sing, single. As with a lot of these album rollouts, I typically tune out of singles after the first one just because you know more and more it feels like it takes away from the experience of the record so i was aware of the album i liked the lead single uh bug like an angel but i kind of was tempering my expectations for what this would be because i like a lot of people was kind of underwhelmed by mitski's last record laurel hell which came out in february of last year like i know that record has its defenders and i don't think it's a bad album but certainly mitski was at the time and still is really but was especially at that point leading up to that record one of my favorite working artists and for the album to bounce off me as hard as it did you know it was it was tough it was disappointing and it felt as though it reflected a place that Mitski was at in terms of her creative impulse in terms of the extent to which creating and putting art out into the world was rewarding for her given that she has had one of the most brutal hostile and complicated relationships with a fan base that any artist has had in the last 10 years particularly solo artists as well you know Mitski you know, for a lot of young people now, by young people I mean like under 20, it may be like a surprise to know that Mitski was an indie darling for a really long time before she was, you know, the the weird, it still feels so weird to call her a superstar, even though she is so famous, especially with young people nowadays. But for the longest time, Mitski's music, you know, just at least in terms of indie music culture, was most talked about, most consumed, most kind of audibly held up by, you know, <laughs> white bearded music journalist indie nerds. It wasn't until 2018's Be the Cowboy, and specifically the song Nobody, which was the big single off of that record, that Mitski's music started kind of crossing over with a, with a new younger audience and, and generally starting to be embraced by a wider population, basically. Very quickly, Mitski developed a fan base of feverish, passionate, and let's be honest, unhealthily parasocially connected young people and you know it's not worth going into the specific dramas that happened in the wake of that some of them were very ugly and the ultimate consequence of that was Mitski completely removing herself from social media she, she used to be a really fun and funny social media presence uh, way back in the day but she had to basically completely cut herself off from that and sort of become a little bit of a hermit at least in terms of as a public persona because it just wasn't healthy or sustainable for her to be in the public eye or to allow herself to be in the open like that it's but anyway all of that led to laurel hell which was very much a sort of continuation of be the cowboy although i think sl to slightly more diminishing return because compared to be the cowboy it felt to me like laurel hell had a lot less diversity and inspiration and color and the various different sounds that it played around with and it's sort of pastiche 80s songwriting thing that it had with songs like the only heartbreaker it felt a little bit played out by that point and it felt like mitski's heart wasn't really in it and i uh, I feel bad talking about the album like that or talking about any album like the artist's heart's not in it because it's a, that I think, you know, involves a certain level of projection that's maybe unfair, but it did feel like a, it wasn't an album that 
inspired me to come back to it very much, even though I think it had some great songs. You know, Heat Lightning, I think it's one of her best songs. But yeah, it seemed to me like the weight and the, you know, the intensity of everything that had been put on Mitski as an artist over the years was kind of starting to, had kind of buckled a little bit. And it felt like that was starting to be reflected in the music, which didn't really feel like, because with Laurel Hell, the, the biggest thing with that record is it just didn't really feel like there was much of a spark of life in it. It felt kind of creatively deadened. It felt quite depressing to listen to while trying to be something a lot more colorful and never quite being able to reconcile that difference. So yeah, in my mind, off the back of Laurel Hell, it felt as though, first of all, I was would not have expected Mitski to make another record so quickly. It felt as though Mitski was basically in a place where music seemed to be a little bit of an obligation, releasing music at least, seemed to be a little bit of an obligation. There wasn't that sense of of creative intensity in it like there is in all of Mitski's best music. So it felt to a certain extent like perhaps Mitski maybe needed to step away for music for a while to just kind of find that creative spirit again, that passion and will inside her that's so audible to me in all of her best music. And so with this new album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We, to me, I think she's found it. I think this record, well, first of all, it sounds like no other Mitski album. It has some of the kind of archaic and old-fashioned and slightly kind of baroque influences shining through in certain moments, but largely, and, and as has been the case for almost all of her records, the songs tend to... Uh, be on the shorter side as well. Mitski tends to have a very particular emotional state or idea that she clearly articulates in a fairly short period of time and then moves on. So in that, in those senses, you know, there's and Mitski as a personality, as a, as a vocal performer, you know, as a as Mitski is still audibly there and recognizable. But in basically every other respect, it feels like a pretty huge departure from Mitski, especially if you want to compare it to the last couple of records, which are. You know, and I, again, I really like Be the Cowboy, but those last two records are super dry to me. They're really kind of, they're well produced. You know, they're, there's clearly a big budget behind them. And Mitski, it's worth saying, has worked with Patrick Highland as her production collaborator on every album she's done. So it's not a question of collaborations or whatever, it's just a question of where Mitski's at in terms of her inspiration. But those last two records have a particularly brittle, and sometimes beigey sound to them that can hold back some of the real fireworks, no pun intended, of her earlier records. While this new album is not exactly a record that explodes out of the speakers at many moments at all, it has that sense of, of muted patience to it that means it's n seldom slapping you over the head with anything, but it is a record where Mitski's compositional style and the, the the soundscapes that Mitski's building have more space inside of them to breathe and to exist. And as a result, the songs feel more intimate. You feel closer to Mitski when you listen to the record. There is a sense of vulnerability that feels real and kind of emotionally devastating that it felt as though Mitski was obfuscating on those last couple of records with the exceptions of certain moments. This is a difficult record for me to talk about. It it hit me the first time I listened to it, and I ran I ran it back a second time immediately afterwards, and it bulldozed me. I think that this has Mitski's strongest collection of songs since Puberty 2, at least, maybe even since Make Out Creek. Although Again, the Mitski who was writing these songs, both in terms of the lyrical approach, but especially in terms of how she sculpts the music of these songs, is a million miles away from the Mitski who made those mid-2010s records. This feels like Mitski's most accomplished and breathtaking and broad and electrifying album maybe ever. Um, it's not my favorite Mitski album, but that's simply because nothing will ever overtake Bury Me at Makeout Creek, purely because of the space in my life that that record occupies. But this is a record that has not stopped punching me in the heart, basically, every single time that I've listened to it. Personally, I 
I'm probably not as familiar with Mitski's entire catalog as maybe most people would assume that I am based on my music taste, just because she's very much the precursor to a lot of, you know, indie, like modern indie rock sort of like tropes and signifiers that people like her and Angel Olsen, I think is another artist I kind of stick in the same mental space as her, presaged a lot of the movements that I feel like created a big ripple effect throughout the, you know, the later era of the 2010s, I guess. So I listened to this and honestly, this is like way more what I expected Mitski to be like before I actually listened to her. I guess this album gives me like the feeling of instilling a sort of purgatorial ennui in me. And while listening to it, you sort of get the overwhelming, you know, the the, the overwhelming sad vibe that you might come to somebody like Mitski for. But at the same time, just saying that kind of does her writing uh, a disservice because it's about like, it's so much more than just what it might feel like on its surface, especially when you consider that, again, this isn't a very long album. My favorite song on here is probably the third song, Heaven. Um, one of my favorite songs that I've heard from Mitski in general, in fact. Like, this uh, opening sort of run is just kind of staggering, really. Like, it just always was something that I looked forward to coming back to it. Uh, and while the second half, I think, may not be as consistent as before, and really, I would only say that because of... I guess my one issue with this album is really lies in the song structures. There are some times on this album where, and I got to emphasize here that I'm really nitpicking here because I think this is all in all a great album, honestly. But when I really hone things down, there are a lot of ideas in the second half of this that I feel like she could have maybe reveled in more. It almost feels like some of these songs are in such a hurry to be over that I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Like, you were really, really captivating me here for a second. And I almost feel like that adds a sense of fleeting wistfulness to a lot of the, again, the emotional tone of this album. But at the same time, when it comes to like the raw musicality of it, I, I mean, I love it, but also there are moments where I'm like, I feel like you could have lingered in these moments for just a little bit longer. Again, this is sort of her doing something new sonically, but also kind of, wrapping up what her artistic identity is and just sort of delivering a state of the union address when it comes to the the the, the heartbreak and facets of, of Mitski as a person. Uh, and that's the part of this album that always resonates. There's simply never a moment where emotionally Mitski loses me here. It's a very satisfying record and if you're going to veer on the side of caution and just be like, all right, I'm gonna really whittle this down to the point where all of this is very, very no bullshit. I very much prefer you straying towards this rather than putting a bunch of excessive, fluffy or inessential moments on your record. This feels like it's, I don't know, again, I'm not as familiar as Mitski with a lot of, than a lot of her fans are, but it does kind of feel like she is making an active attempt to bounce back from where she was before. And I feel like this maybe gives her a set of horse blinders that gives her some simultaneous clarity but also something that might hold some people me for instance at just the tiniest bit of a distance but again that's all very very negligible because i really enjoy this broadly speaking it's not unusual for mitski to write about her relationship with being a songwriter and mm -hmm what it is like to create art and put art out into the world and have this version of yourself that you have to sculpt and ultimately negotiate with. And it's particularly not foreign for Mitski to write about that with relation to being depressed and being mentally ill. And, you know, these kinds of things, songwriters writing about mental illness and depression and songwriters writing about songwriting almost feel tropey or like cliches when i present them so abstractly but the way that mitski writes about them to me mitski is one of the greatest songwriters that we have working you use the word efficient uh, to describe the record and i think that that is one of the strengths of mitski as a writer she is brutally efficient in the way that she describes her emotional state and her relationship with 
depression, self-image, and health in general. Not even just mental, but just the way that she the way the relationship she has with her body and i don't even just mean in like a body image sort of way but just in terms of every facet of of being alive at a given moment and i'll try not to get too far out into the ether with that and, and bring it back to the songs themselves and again i love this record it's not just because it's Mitski being Mitski. Mitski. it's because i think that Mitski is writing some of the best songs she has ever written i've always found Mitski arresting as a songwriter and as a vocal presence. Bury Me at Makeout Creek and Puberty 2 are arresting albums. They are albums where the writing is so brutal and so cutting, but so direct that they're almost impossible to listen to passively. No matter what sound she's mm-hmm. with, even when she you know, has softer songs on a record like Puberty 2, she is clinical in her writing and i feel like when i use terms like efficient and clinical these kinds of mechanical terms it sounds emotionless but mitski is able to write some of the most emotional songs i've ever heard clinically surgically she extracts the most brutal and you know self swallowing emotional experiences that she's had and it can put them into a handful of words she does that consistently throughout this record as well and what makes it stand out is the sense of control and clarity and comfort that Mitski seems to have with these darker parts of herself these darker desires that she has these unhealthy habits that she has you know there's multiple references to alcoholism across this record not least in lead single bug like an angel which again mitski's songwriting is so great it's a song that's entirely frozen within a single moment of seeing a dead bug at the bottom of your glass and in the way that she captures every sense of that experience of of being completely shit-faced seeing a bug in your glass and thinking it looks like an angel every stable part of you at once collapsing it's overwhelming i know i like the song as a single i I thought i again arresting i keep coming back to obvious words but that really was what it was but now listening to it in the album (laughs) it takes the wind out of me and Mitski is able to do that consistently with her writing across the record, even as the various sound palettes she works with can veer from something as quiet and vocally driven as Bug Like an Angel to the lush country folk of songs like Heaven and The Frost, for instance. And when memories snow and the fan favorite, my love or mine or mine. Mitski's never struggled to write in a way that cuts through and puts you inside of her emotional situation and lets you feel the rawness of the wound that she's scratched open. But never before has she been able to pair that with such accomplished sophisticated beautiful and i really will emphasize that beautiful because i don't think mitski's really tried to make beautiful music all that much at least not until recently there are moments on records like be the cowboy that i would describe as beautiful and there are moments in a record like puberty too that i would describe as beautiful but this is the first mitski record that takes my breath away with the sheer majesty of its sound and while i understand and completely uh you know i don't say that in a condescending way or i genuinely understand the sense with which that arresting beauty can feel aloof when it's so compact you know what i mean in such short songs Mm -hmm. for me that is where so much of the violence of the emotional impact comes from it is how fleeting 
these moments are it is how fleeting and 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 ephemeral and gutting these experiences are one of the most arresting songs in the record is the deal where mitski writes about it's like a it's like a play on a on a cliche the cliche of you know i would sell my soul for x and mm-hmm. in this song it's not i would sell my soul for this thing or that thing or this thing it's i would sell my soul to be rid of my soul to not have a soul anymore and it's this single moment where she's sort of out in nature and she has this totally meaningless on the face of it encounter with a bird and entirely dissociates and imagines herself giving her soul up to that bird and then realizing once her soul is gone that all that's left is a cage you know that she was a cage containing her soul and now that she has begged for it to be taken away all that's left is bars and coldness and even though the soul that was in that cage was the thing that brought her pain and suffering every day of her life she doesn't want to just be a cage and there's a moment in the towards the end of the song where you know it's it's such a lush and soft and really tastefully arranged album that the moments where Mitski veers from that are so shocking and so there's a moment towards the end of the song where It's like these staticky, glitchy electronic drums just pile in to the mix. And it's suffocating and it's shocking. And it is capital V violent. It's one of the purest and most just intense expressions of emotion that I've heard on an album all year. This hollow panic that happens in this nightmare of emptiness. And Mitski is able to create those feelings with such astonishing clarity so regularly throughout the record i love the way that she talks about her relationship with her memories on this album and the past to me that's where some of the most brutal writing comes from and some of the most personally relatable for me two of the greatest songs in this respect i think are i don't like my mind and when memories snow these songs like i mean i'll just read some of the lyrics from i don't like my mind and we can kind of just sit in them for a second i don't like my mind i don't like being left alone in a room all its opinions about the things that i've done so yeah i blast music loud and i work myself to the bone and on an inconvenient christmas i eat a cake a whole cake all for me and then i get sick and throw up (laughs) And there's another memory that gets stuck inside the walls of my skull, waiting for its turn to talk. And it may be a few years, but you can bet it's still there, waiting for me to be left alone in a room with the things that I've done. A whole cake. So please don't take this job from me. So much to unpack there. It's one of the most Mitski-ass Mitski songs from a writing perspective, just in terms of the tropes that she uses. It's a song about being a songwriter. Don't take this job from me. The extent to which she's become attached to what she does, her role as an artist, but also as an employee to her art, essentially someone who has to draw upon, you know, the worst experiences that they've ever had. These things that, these memories that get caught inside this mind that she is trapped within, if she ever wants to do her job to be an artist, to create something of meaning, she has to work herself to the bone. Getting fixated on that aspect of her identity, intertwining with this image of a whole cake that she's just feasting on, this thing that she is gorging herself on, this way that she is relieving her suffering. The, the writing is even more acute on When Memories Snow. When Memories Snow and cover up the driveway, I shovel all those memories. I clear the path to drive to the store. And when memories melt, I hear them in the drain pipe, dripping through the downspout as I lie awake in the dark. And if I break, could I go on break? Be back in my room, writing speeches in my head, listening to the thousand hands that clap for me in the dark. The thing that makes the record different than just being another record about Mitski's cycle of suffering 
and unhealthy coping coping mechanisms and negotiating with that aspect of herself in order to create and in order to be a part of a capitalistic system. All that stuff is typical Mitski fodder, right? The part in the writing that makes this feel like a real step forward for Mitski is the thread of optimism that I feel comes through in this record as well. Mitski is not an optimistic songwriter. Mitski is almost suffocatingly pessimistic in her music. That's where a lot of the appeal is for people like myself and people like us who I'm sure, you know, a lot of the times go for me, go to music for a kind of cathartic basking in the lowest places that we can get. And Mitski's always, you know, had a hot wire to my heart and been able to ruin me by making those emotions feel more compacted, more violent, more assaultive than most other songwriters are capable of doing. So for Mitski to see a way out of that, for Mitski to see a way through, and for it to feel not like a delusion, but like almost a logical conclusion to this wrestling that's happening inside of her, that everything has to align, that everything has to balance. It's really an emotional thread. And it does come through in songs like My Love, Mine or Mine, Heaven, Star, and especially the final track, I Love Me After You, which is a stunning song about learning about that feeling in the wake of a relationship that, whether it was unhealthy or, or whatever it was, that ultimately was constrictive by its end, ultimately leaves you in a, in a state that's so liberated you might as well be reborn. That's a really cathartic place for the record to end. And I mentioned the song Star as well. That might be my favorite song on the whole album. It is just... One of mine. <sighs> it's not just that it's a it has a beautiful, gentle swell to one of the most cathartic eruptions of any song she's ever written. It's also, again, that her perspective on love wistful pained accepting graceful is so multifaceted is so beautiful that it actually has affected i feel like it's affected my own view of love <laughs> our fundamental experience in a way that's so rare to have your view of something fundamental in the universe like <laughs> melded somewhat by a song but just this this metaphor for love relating love to the light from stars in this song we were so glad to have found it that love is like a star it's gone we just see it shining it's traveled very far i'll keep a left over light burning so you can keep looking up isn't that worth holding on i i, I can only render these words trite by reiterating them, that it is an astonishingly poignant view of love, that it is, and I, and I you could read it through a pessimistic lens, that, that Mitski views love inherently as the product of something that is already dead, but that is lingering, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the sole reading, you know, it's that, it's that we don't know whether love, the light we see from stars in this metaphor is something that's coming from something alive or something dead. We don't know whether the light we see when we look at the stars is coming from a living star or a dead star that's just projecting its light still, that that the light has had to travel so far that we don't realize yet that it's dead. We don't know that. We don't know. We just see the light. And we trust that light on face value. We take that in and we accept that we don't know whether the star is alive or dead, we just keep looking up and we hold on to it. That shit is God level. <laughs> and yeah, and then in a song like I'm Your Man, the following song, which, you know, <laughs> Mitski goes from this, if not outright hopeful, then, you know, emotionally 
nuanced and wistful view of love to this self-deprecating, crushing sense of, of devalue, of devaluation that comes in the wake of, of subjugating yourself for someone, you know, for so long. I'm sorry I'm the one you love. No one will ever love me like you again. So when you leave me, I should die. I deserve it, don't I? I can feel it getting near like flashlights coming down the way. One day you'll figure me out. I'll meet judgment by the hounds. People always gave me love. Others were never to blame after all. You believe me like a god, I betray you like a man. She's working through some shit. It's fair to say. And, you know, having Star, this song about, you know, this, like I said, this wistful acceptance of unknowing in the face of love. Like we don't know what the, what love will mean for us. We just accept it or we choose to accept it. And then into the song about heartbreak and ruination and self-loathing. Then into I Love Me After You, this song about reconciliation and reformation and rebirth and love for yourself. You know, it's it's a stunning art to end the record on. It's a it's an incredible album from Mitski. I I'm unashamedly in love with it. It's grown to be one of my favorite albums of the year. It is an album that induces or I think demands a certain level of intimacy from you in the way that you approach it and that i think is helped by the sense of intimacy that the record conveys sonically is recorded in this nashville studio and more than any record mitski's made since bury me you really feel like you're in the room with her you really feel like you're sitting there next to her in the dark especially on a song like bug like an angel for a mitski record to be able to make me feel like that that's that that's my favorite thing to get out of a Mitski record is this level of intimacy and connection that she chooses to offer and it's for the first time ever it feels like that intimacy and connection is being extended to the listener to help them and to offer a difficult at times ugly and violent but ultimately healthy and positive way of looking at things and you know, it never feels trite, it never feels obvious, it never feels reductive, and it never feels like something you've heard somewhere else. That's Mitski's greatest accomplishment, I think, is through her artistic persona, which is so constructed, and we know it's so constructed because Mitski has had to separate herself from her fans and has had to kind of put up all of these walls. So we know it's constructed. But we take it on face value. We let ourselves be invited in. And, you know, more than just, because this is the thing, I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'm finishing up now. I know I'm going on, but I promise I'm finishing up now. With these previous records, it's felt like, with Laurel, a record like Laurel Hell, it's felt like Mitski's deliberately been kind of trying to freeze out. Not her fans necessarily, but she's kind of just been trying to distance herself from people. I think. And those records feel very, not hostile to the listener, but they don't feel welcoming to the listener. They feel as though I am Mitski, I'm here performing in my role as a pop, indie pop rock songwriter, basically. Here is what I'm delivering. Here is my, you know, experience, my emotions. And you accept it. You take it or don't take it or whatever, but I'm putting it out there. Whereas here it feels like Mitski's opening a door between you and the version of herself that she's putting forward. And she's inviting a moment of, of stillness and connection. And hopefully, if you need it, something to help you in an actual like productive way, more than just catharsis. And so that's what the album has been for me anyway. I'm, I'm projecting a whole bunch into it. But yeah, that's what the album is to me. It's um, as someone who's followed Mitski you know, ever since the release of Bury Me at Makeout Creek, when it was just a, a little band camp baby and had less than 100 ratings on Rate Your Music, it's been a joy to follow Mitski over the years and especially affirming for me to see that she's come out of a place where I connected with her less than ever to create what I think is genuinely one of her greatest works and maybe, all things considered, her most accomplished album. So... Hats off.
that kind of thread of optimism that Riley mentioned, I feel like is something that shouldn't go unappreciated just because I feel like artists like Mitski, uh, you know, they kind of get a, a, a unfairly maligned as you know the, the the sad girl core artists and i kind of feel like we've talked about a lot of these people this year even again boy genius being another example of this where the actual nuance of the writing on display is kind of overlooked because of the general vibe that the artist gives off so it is i feel like really important to appreciate that there are definite layers here and those layers specifically feedback into kind of like what I was saying about like this album kind of giving across a sort of purgatorial feeling like a lot of those lyrical ideas that she toys with you know like selling her soul or just like being trapped or just like these ideas of just being within a, a space where it just sort of feels like these coping mechanisms that Mitski has been talking about for a while now are things that it's almost like this album is not an exploration of relying on those coping mechanisms to to deal with everything else, but becoming those coping mechanisms and then all like trying to find solace after you get to your worst moment. Like it's the 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 point at which there is no return, but you have to find yourself in whatever space that you, you know, found yourself in essentially you you have to kind of dig deeper and sort of uncover a feedback loop that may be something that uh i guess a lot of people are finding a lot more refreshing which is why a lot of people are receiving this a little bit more warmly than perhaps her previous two records have been received yeah. but it's it's led to me finding that wavelength with her and understanding her in a way that i previously thought i didn't so that has been particularly rewarding to live with I'm glad you've had that like experience with with Mitski because the three Mitski albums you've heard are like all from such distinct eras of her as an artist. Like they're mm -hmm. they're so different from one another. If you were going to listen to any three Mitski albums, you know they're it's a good little um, assortment, right? Because you're getting so many different aspects of where she's at creatively and emotionally with those three albums. I didn't have a room anywhere to fit this in my a you know analysis slash slash spiel but i just want to say shout out to mitski for writing the single most devastating lyric of the year which is you're my best friend and now i have no one to tell how i lost my best friend <laughs> been thinking about that one for a while so <laughs> but yeah mitski is also like she's sort of <sighs> Easy to, it's easy to forget this now, especially because she's kind of disappeared from the public eye so much in contrast to people like Phoebe Bridges or whoever who are so in the public eye and so active in their public image that Mitski is really kind of an elder stateswoman of the sort of indie mm -hmm. songwriter that's in vogue right now and has been for the last, you know, six years or whatever. She's kind of an originator or a, a presage or a kind of, you know, a day one -er, so to speak. Um, but the real like i think the 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 benefit that she's offered herself in the public conscience and the public consciousness by removing herself from being a public figure by not you know doing interviews and instagrams and tiktoks and all that kind of stuff is that she has allowed herself and her to just exist as an artist not as a figure mm -hmm. not as someone who's around saying shit and doing shit she just is someone who puts out records every so often and you talk about the records i i really hope that a lot of people follow in her stead because it's very refreshing yeah okay now let's move on to our second review of the day in many ways the most heavily anticipated review that we've done in recent times i think by the mm. two or three people who have now have been audibly excited for it to so shout out you guys special a special shout out to uh, our family in motion who i know has been fiending for this review for a while uh, and anyone who's come to watch us talk about the new national album the latest national album, yet another installment in the seemingly ongoing national retrospective. Um, <laughs> the second two pages of Frankenstein themselves, we're of course talking about Laugh Track. The Is this the 10th national album, I want to say? I think it is the 10th national album, actually. Holy shit. There were whispers of this for a while. I know that I think we even talked about when we reviewed first two pages of Frankenstein, I see, have a vague memory of, of talking about how they ultimately ended up having a lot more songs when they wrote that record than they knew what to do with, you know, the old classic age old 
uh, story, but it did seem like that was a something that might potentially come to fruition as well because they were continuing to play new songs in their live show that weren't on the album. And then there were whispers of being in the studio. I think I, I wasn't following it particularly closely as well, but it seemed like they were on in the process of recording things as they were touring as well. I'm not clear on how much of what they recorded while touring actually made it onto the record. I know Smoke Detector definitely came from recording while being on tour as well, but I think the bulk of this record was recorded the same time or around the same time as first two pages. It was certainly a lot of it was written around the same time as well. And you know, while in a lot of respects, it still, it definitely feels like a national album in the 2020s, as opposed to a national album in the 2010s or the 2000s, there are other pretty considerable distinctions that separate this from first two pages of Frankenstein, both obvious ones in terms of sound, but also more kind of subtle ones in terms of writing and, and things below the hood as well. And oh boy, I've been fucking, I, I, and I apologize to anyone who's been waiting for us to talk about this because, you know, we are a little bit late talking about this. It has been out for a couple of weeks now, but I have been, I'm not going to be late. I've been listening to the fucking shit out of this that whole time. You ain't the only one. This, let me tell you, there was an element of tragedy to our last national review, you know, going back to it and, and watching us not necessarily try to make excuses for it, but also just like be so audibly pained by how we were in mourning to it. Yeah. We were in a kind of mourning, you know, and it was the same. Yeah, like, we weren't in denial. We were so, we were adequately harsh on the album. We were definitely we, like, we weren't, um, disguising our feelings in any way but there was a certain degree of like delusion it felt like if you know like no this is just the, you know this is the bad album they needed to make in order to be good again sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> it may be more eloquent words than that but that's basically kind of what it boiled down to it, it's a... it would be more difficult to illustrate if they basically didn't confirm that idea by releasing this album <laughs> Well, and again, I don't want to read into it too much, but there are a few like interesting little details that kind of do feel a little bit like Jab's last album, or if not Jab's, then deliberate attempts to distance this record from the last one, while at the same time also very explicitly connecting it to the last one by the cover art, <laughs> which is just the last album, but okay, you can have a background this time, have a setting for this kid and this and the Paul Medican, you know, the, the ongoing um Hey I'm Paul. The ongoing the ongoing story of Paul. The obvious thing that everyone every national fan, you know, immediately noticed and stood out is that the record is a lot more animated than first two pages of Frankenstein, which was pointedly muted as an album. Like there was a noticeable Sedate. absence noticeable absence of of real drums tm and a, like also just a, a genuine a general sense of kind of floaty malaise that the national have certainly done before but that felt particularly kind of mired in a sort of despondent creative dead space that the band or at the very least matt seemed to be in you know there was some cynical reads of the record as well it was like you know coming off the back of of aaron Dessner producing those records for taylor swift it was like oh well the national trying to bit like appeal to uh, a taylor swift audience with this album you know the, the taylor swift feature on the record as well also being a kind of point of derision for those people and like while look while it is a certainly a more obviously a more muted and maybe a more maybe a less sort of off-putting that album. album is not going to be designed to appeal to anyone who listens to pop music well like I, I think to a certain extent you know there's aspects of the production on that record and also the more simplistic writing style in certain moments that maybe could, could have been intended to kind of allow for some of the taylor swift spillover audience to kind of find a footing in the national but also like i don't know that that theory sort of falls apart a little bit for me the more you kind of get into it because also first yeah. three, the other thing was is as well that first two pages of frankenstein is like a you know an excessively middle-aged guy album like it's excessively about you know like you know creative strife and being in your 40s and and all of these very like things that you would not expect a lot of people who maybe might have come from the taylor swift records to relate to and certainly 
it feels like apart from the Alcott, which was the Taylor Swift song, that record didn't really, you know, catch on with anyone from that side of things and really bring them any new any new audience members. And to their credit, you know, I, I it did it feels like the national made the record they wanted to make. It feels like Matt wrote from the perspective of reflected where he was at, which was a place of real frustration, a place of reassessing the things that he has in his life and trying to be more grateful for them as well. I think that really came through on songs like Send From Me and Tropic Morning News, for instance. You know, look, we reviewed that album. We don't need to get into it again. But there are, I, I mentioned these things only because they're like little pins that I'm going to return to when I talk about how certain songs on this record and how they kind of contrast. But yeah, all that to say, this is a much livelier album. Brian is back hammering the kit almost to a degree where it feels like he's going so hard to make up for his absence on that previous record. Like I think of a song like Turn Off the House, for instance, which is like this moody, kind of quite slow paced ballad that has this fucking firepower from him just completely hammering these fills. It's like, if you, like you know, take a fucking song. Like, it's like, he, it's like how they write a song like Slipped and then decided to put some fucking uh, Gavin Harrison style playing in it. I mean, that's like, <laughs> that's like half of Boxer. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, if I'm going to make, uh, you know, meaningless, but very nerdy national reference points, the uh, atmosphere of this album the spaciness that it that it has, you know, in a production sense, is most reminiscent of Trouble Will Find Me, compared to the records that followed it. Um, you know, because Sleep Well Beast and I Am Easy to Find both felt like more consciously cluttered, uh, production wise. I don't say that in a negative way. It's just like there was a distinct sense of like trying to create a real busyness to those albums. So this record feels like you know it's casting back a little bit more to the spaciousness of trouble will find me but then you have that you know animated rhythm section and yeah it does feel very boxery or high violin-esque it feels like you're going a little bit further back with that aspect to make the record feel like it's a you know again not to get too labored and comparing it to previous national albums but it does feel a little bit like a kind of amalgam of various eras of the national uh, and in these details, but thoroughly written from the perspective of Matt Berninger in the here and now. You know, it's a kind of willfully difficult album in certain respects. And in other respects, it can feel like a, a willfully fan servicey album. It's, I think, <sighs> I'm going to call it, it's one of the messiest National albums. But honestly, I feel like the National are pretty messy with their albums in general. Like they have very yeah. few albums. Yeah, tough call. I, they have very few albums I think I would call like, you know, uh, traditionally coherent in structure. You have maybe Boxer and Good. I know that's really it. I think their records tend to be shaggier, and as their career has gone on as well, you know, from Trouble Will Find, from High Violet, Trouble Will Find Me, Sleep Well Beast, I'm Easy to Find. Each one of those albums was longer than the last. Right, the, the records were getting shaggier, and if you view first two pages and Laugh Track as a kind of like weird light dark double album then this collective thing is, is even longer the nationals damnation deliverance truly Christ. yeah or, or yeah <laughs> i've gone towards and then away from and then towards again the viewing this in a dichotomy with first two pages uh i think that there's a lot of ways in which it kind of works as an alternate version of that album that deals with some of the same emotional states, but from a different place or I, I don't know. I'll get it into that shit a bit later. I'm getting too ahead of myself and I'm talking for way too long. I know we were all really excited for this album. We were really into uh, particularly space invader. One of the two big singles that they dropped in advance of this record, because that song was like, Holy shit, the national are giving us the, faithful sound of their live show in the studio for the first time ever it felt like or maybe at least since high violet um but what are your guys general thoughts on this record how it compares to the last one uh how you've been digging it and what do you think in particular stands out that makes this a particularly strong national album for you guys the angle that i'm looking at this record at is that like for the longest time I've struggled with the idea of uh what 
national album do you recommend somebody for the first time? The problem with answering that question is that there's way too many good answers. I guess the problem with something like Trouble Will Find Me, which would be probably be my answer, uh, just because it's the most wide-reaching, I guess, of their albums. The problem with that is that it's the stepping stone album between their, their more concrete 2010 sound and the 2000s. So it doesn't fully represent either. You know, something like Sleep Well Beast or I Am Easy to Find is just two in the weeds to start with. The first two pages of Frankenstein is a non-starter. The self-titled is a non-starter. Sad songs for dirty lovers, like maybe depending on the person, but probably no. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think Boxer and High Violet are good answers, but again, those are so indicative of a particular era for this band that it's like, what's the thing that isn't me ultimately just going, just listen to like all of them. And so I think Laugh Track has finally sort of delivered that album from this band that I can recommend as the starting point. Again, because it's it's sort of wide-reaching and messy, and it's willing to live in these uh, spaces that it creates. And a lot of these spaces that it creates are fairly distinct from one another. Like I think of the, the last two tracks on the album, Crumble and Smoke Detector, and I feel like they couldn't, be more disparate from each other in terms of what this band has done before. Crumble most reminds me of Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers and yeah. Smoke Detector most reminds me of, I mean, just any live performance of one of their more raucous songs, really. But like, I, I get like a lot of like Murder Me Rachel, specifically the live cut on Cherry Tree. Uh, Weird Goodbyes, for instance, to jump back further into the album, is so I am easy to find and Sleep Well Beast coded to me. Deep End feels like the most trouble will find me that any song it's that like, is not on that album has ever sounded. I saw someone uh, bring up like how much musical similarity that song shares with Don't Swallow the Cap. And ever since yeah. like, I read that, I'm like, fuck, those songs are. Yeah. Ugly. So it's weird. It's like not a career summary album, but it does. I, I get what you're getting at, Morgan. It, it does feel like. You know, for the real national heads who've like really imbibed the entire discography, you can feel shades of these different eras that they've existed within coming through in different songs. But now it being, definitely covers the most bases. But now having this like new context, you know, the national, if, if first two pages felt a little bit like an identity crisis of, you know, what kind of band are we? What are we going to write about? How are we going to exist going forward? Laugh Track feels, if not like a, a res resolution of the identity crisis, at the very least, like a, a collision of this wide history of the national, of, of all these different ways that they've sounded over the years to make them feel, if not more original than ever, then certainly more invigorated than ever. It just, And that's what I kind of mean, I think, by the fan service thing, where it just does feel like it delivers the most comforting familiar you know versions of the national over the years that you've grown to love and uh, you know tweaked a little bit in a slightly new way uh so that it feels just enough like it's not simply ripping themselves off they managed to create this feeling almost of like a, a career highlight album um without ever wanting to do that but i think sort of accidentally through the the eventual journey of um, and this is just sort of also what I'm inferring from uh, so many of the interviews that they've given um, is that, you know, they hit their identity crisis moment with first two pages of Frankenstein and while Laugh Track isn't like the, oh, we've solved that moment. Uh, what Laugh Track is to me is just like the fuck it moment of just like, oh, well, I mean, we're here. We might as well be the national. Just doing what comes to them instinctually. So much of this record feels so much more like a gut check moment to me in the sense of just chasing what comes to them in the moment, sort of instinctually. I think that's where a lot of the sort of live energy on the record comes from is just really living in those moments of just like, where does the song take us from here? And I think it's something really singular in the discography for that. Because every, every national album up to this one feels so painstaking and deliberate in ways that are both the best things about them, but also their biggest hindrances. 
in some ways, especially in that. I think that that really the latter really came to a head on first two pages of Frankenstein, where it feels so extraordinarily reserved. But yeah, this record, it's the How Do We Be a Band Again album. Uh, for a lot of years as well, it's like they've, I don't know if they've said anything to this effect, but certainly critics have been kind of like fiending for the Nationals garage rock album where they kind of just like throw back, you know, a lot of my favorite critics as well, you know, people like Steve Hyden have been saying shit like, want to hear him scream again, like on Alligator, want to hear the band, like really discover that sort of energy again. And while this isn't really that, or at least not that idealized, slightly masturbatory fantasy of a national album it is like consciously a rediscovery of the things that have animated them and that have endeared them and that have been the most passionate things they've done over the years to a certain degree it felt maybe and i think i felt this a little bit when we were talking about first two pages where it like felt like after making a record as unwieldy and experimental and conceptually heavy as I am easy to find, it felt like first two pages was almost like a kind of overcorrection, like a sense to be like across the 2010s, their records were getting longer and longer and longer. And they were getting more kind of, you know, spilling over with ideas and, and just loaded with national type beat stuff going further and further down the rabbit hole and so first two pages felt like a, a deliberately like an acknowledgement of that for the people who were kind of getting off the train a bit with how those records were were hitting and of course we aren't those people we love that progression in their, in their 2010 stuff you know watch our video on i'm easy to find and you will see the most rapturous discussion of that album i guarantee you will find anywhere and so for us that sense of like course correction that first two pages seemed like it imbued was disappointing to be honest because it was we didn't feel as though there was a correction needed and certainly while it it seemed as though the national were absolutely with a record like i'm easy to find they were kind of pushing themselves really far out and they were kind of going you know into the wilderness with this multimedia project it makes sense that they would want to peer things back but it's like it's laugh track is the kind of album you want to hear as the peering back laugh track is the kind of album you want to hear as the course correction you know to use those words it's not first two pages you don't course correct by sanitizing and sapping your music of so much of the emotional energy that makes it what it is you course correct by doing something like this right by pulling things back taking stock of the things that you're best at the things that have made you endear over the years finding a way to imbue that all those sort of reliable old fashioned national things with where you're at right now in terms of, you know, the aesthetic and, and the style and the, and the writing, that kind of stuff. And just channeling forward in that way, you know, bringing the past into the present like that. And that's what this record is. And it's just, it's, it's like, it took an extra album for them to get there, you know, and it's tempting to think about how heavily should we read this as a response or, or like, you know, in the light of that previous record would this record have happened if the previous record hadn't happened i mean i don't know i'm curious what you guys think but jake haven't heard from you yet uh what are your thoughts on this record and the weird i guess dichotomy that it exists in with the last album they released i hate to say it because the more i listened to this and the more i thought about it the more two things happened the more a i just flat out loved it and B, the more I was just like, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really like, you know, it, it is, you know, of course, interesting to speculate, like, what exactly happened in the process to make these two albums and what, you know, did one lead to the other? Where are we going to get either, no matter what anyway, you know, who's to say? But my feelings about Frankenstein kind of just further got amplified and it became much more difficult for me to have even a slightly nuanced take on that album because the way I think about these two records in relation to one another is that this doesn't necessarily feel like a response to that album. It feels to me anyway, like a clarification because I think that, that Morgan and I specifically, when we were talking about that album, like Morgan in particular said, like, I understand why you know, they were having trouble with the material they were writing with because the material wasn't really that interesting to begin with. And here, that's the miraculous thing is that 
you know, thematically, conceptually, there's really not a lot going on here that's all that different. And we really got into the weeds of what we thought Frankenstein was, you know, about, uh, which wasn't very surface level things. You kind of had to dig deep in there. I think we were kind of primed to do that just because that album was so underwhelming that we were just kind of searching for something. We were like, okay, what well, what is it about this, the construction of this that makes it this way? So we had to really get into the weeds of it. Whereas here, it feels like it's dealing with a lot of the same ideas and it just, it feels like the band know how to make it come through better. And at the end of the day, I feel like that's sort of what, I value about this experience the most is because I, I think about records in a lot of different ways now that we've had this podcast and a lot of them are albums that are in response to something. And a lot of the time when we have a disconnect from those albums, it's because they are so wrapped up in being a response to whatever came before it, to fan backlash or praise or fame or whatever that they forget to be music in the first place which is kind of why i went into this with some trepidation because it's just like okay if this is a kind of response record are we just going to get something that burrows into its own asshole and just kind of becomes this nexus of whatever and thankfully we don't get that at all not only do i feel like it does what frankenstein was trying to do with its more sedate atmosphere and trying to communicate a sense of artistic synergy with being like this is how i feel and this is how this is going to sound and they're going to be in communion with one another but to me here this is an album that is the national at their most surprisingly danceable this is like a really like it's a lively record in a way that some of their you know newer albums were at their again their most colorful moments but to me there's a sustained level of energy on here that just doesn't really quit and what's remarkable is that this never comes at the expense of still creating an atmosphere that makes it feel like a a national album and feels like it's in concert of what Matt and company are writing about like the fact that these, again, these hilariously, stupidly awesome Brian Devendorf drum fills are just decorating this entire album. In theory, that should work against what the band is doing. But instead, these guys are such, you know, production whiz kids at this point, is that no matter how much energy the performances give off, the production reigns everything in to sort of meld together in a way that just feels so right. Morgan said about uh, the Olivia Rodrigo album, Guts, that it's the ideal sophomore album in that his least favorite songs on that album were as good as his favorite songs on Sour. And I more or less feel that way about this and Frankenstein and that my least favorite songs on here are about as good as the best things on the last album. Uh, and even then, I view them more as interstitial moments between bigger, grander, more striking moments that honestly I feel like the National have stayed kind of clear of for a little while now like they're they're very oriented about around being you know album artists and their construction of albums is very particular kind of like Riley said they're not exactly like they're disciplined but they're disciplined in a way that they know how to make whatever mess they conjure up work this is an album that feels effortless in a way that I feel like the national has never felt before. And so, yeah, maybe it's not the most like cleanly constructed thing in the world, but in just terms of a musical experience, bless, it is satisfying as all hell. Like before Space Invader, you get the title track on here, for instance, which I just think is like the pinnacle of what they've been doing so far this decade, frankly. Not only do they rectify the problem that they had with the last record where I was infuriated by their insistence on making features prominent parts of the titles of these songs. And I was like, why are you doing this when you're barely featuring these? You never put featuring Sufjan Stevens on Afraid of Everyone, you fucking cowards exactly and i was just like so what is the fucking deal with this here and then they come along and they it's finally like, it's like featuring sufjan stevens on once upon a poolside but lisa hannigan seems like the entirety of so far so fast and nothing no feature she gets paid dust america explain finally finally i asked before in the last why in the goddamn hell are you going to get Phoebe Bridgers on your album if you're going to have her deliver borderline vocal harmonies and that's it? 
Here, she actually shows up. She contributes to this song in a way that feels meaningful, in a way that feels dynamic. And I'm like, finally, you guys didn't forget how to do this. You just <laughs> didn't for whatever reason last time. And Crumble, penultimate song on here featuring Roseanne Cash. Love her contribution to the song on here. I like, again, it, it's not like these are only three features on across this whole album. They're not like, you know, it's it's not exactly like you, the, the album is trying to make this part stand out like um, I Am Easy to Find did, for example. But it still feels like they're taking the lessons they learned in previous albums and actually applying them rather than just the... I guess starting from scratch of first two pages of Frankenstein, that album just in hindsight now, regardless of how it came to be, feels like it exists on such an island now that it feels ignorable. Like, again, I feel like I'm being excessively harsh to that record, and perhaps I am, but when Morgan and I kind of, like, on the last record, when you were just like, you know, this feels like an album of B-sides, regardless of whether or not that album's reception or that album led to the creation of this one, it really does feel like that is just further accentuated because that feels like a bunch of leftovers. Our friend Hannah had a really posted something that I, I thought was a really interesting thought experiment, which is what if they had released these two albums as they are in the reverse order. And I think that if they had done that, then, you know, first two pages of Frankenstein would still be a, a you know, considerably weak album for them. But I feel like we would hold it bottom in, tier. We would hold it in contempt considerably less than I feel like we do. Oh, we would have already gotten our, yeah. full, you know what I mean? We would yes. have gotten our fill and it would have been like, okay, here's an extra national album. Songs aren't maybe as good as their best stuff, but hey, it's more national. But releasing them the way they did really like it, it, it really hindered frankenstein and it's really benefited this i feel like if yes they've been released in reverse order we would be maybe a little bit harsher on laugh track and a little bit more positive on frankenstein so it's weird how the release and order has i think affected the way that both of these albums play you know to the detriment of frankenstein and absolutely to the benefit of this album when it comes to viewing it in isolation i feel like maybe for as again effortless as it feels the construction of it feels a bit undervalued by people. This is certainly, again, it's better received, like people are digging it more, but the actual construction of it still feels thoughtful to me in a way that, you know, national albums always are, maybe even more so than some of their albums. But to me, it's a record that still manages to take bold steps in a new direction, but simultaneously without suffering the consequences of perhaps the band trying to occupy a space that they haven't ever before. It's an album that I feel like I kind of totally agree with you, Morgan. I didn't really ever think about it from the perspective of national album I would recommend to people, but I do kind of struggle with that because the national are again, a band that I'm always like all of their albums are growers essentially. And if you're not like deep into this specific kind of, you know, depressed indie rock, then I will have a difficult time, you know, trying to sell the national to you as a whole. But when it comes to this specifically, I'm like, I don't know, this displays enough strengths and it is the easiest national album to listen to and enjoy for me. Like it is maybe, again, I don't think it's like the best or anything. I, if I had to like put it in context, I think this is, occupies like a perfect sort of middle in their discography for me. And that's kind of what I feel like it's almost designed to do. It's sort of the band summarizing who they are, what they're doing, what their interests are, where they are instrumentally as musicians, as artists, as writers, as all this looking back, but also potentially looking forward. I think if you cut to the heart of it, what was really disappointing about first two pages of Frankenstein is that it felt like the first time, and still to date the only time, the National have ever made a record that feels like they are consciously trying to be the national i may be projecting this but a lot of it i think comes out of the much discussed bout of violent writer's block that matt had yeah behind that record and so a lot of it feels like a careful rediscovery of the national after a period of like creative saturation. Remember, Sleep Well Beast and Easy to Find were records that were released kind of closer together than people remember. And there's a lot of material between mm -hmm. those two records, a lot of touring they've done, a lot of the national saturation. And so 
The thing about first two pages is that it feels like a combination of both that saturation of, of creative material they put out and the writer's block led to a record that felt very self-consciously careful as though it was purposefully holding back for the sake of just trying to focus on one detail at a time, getting one little thing right and perhaps even leaning further on the side of of letting the songs feel a bit emptier and letting the songs feel a bit lighter rather than piling into them. That felt very self-conscious and that felt very deliberate as a way to kind of ease themselves back into being a band, basically. Laugh Track has a considerably higher level of confidence and a considerably higher level of willingness to go further and pile into the songs things that they maybe not maybe might not necessarily need or that might maybe take them a little bit more kind of further than they would typically go there's a little there's a lot less restraint on this album than they typically have on their previous records as a national fan through the 2010s one of my consistent like quibbles with their albums is that i would you know consume the live versions of these songs before the albums came out and i'd be like why did they tone this down on the album version this like guitar solo or this thing or this that why did they cut that or why did they make it softened so this feels like a deliberate and conscious effort to not do those things to stop themselves from doing the kind of tasteful perfecting that they have done on previous records and to kind of let the record just be a little bit more raucous as a result of that i do think it's a messy album i do think it's an unwieldy album in certain ways there is enough of that tastefulness that they've come to kind of be known by for the record to feel as though it does have a sense of moderation in it. You know, I think songs like dreaming songs like alphabet city songs like Hornets are very tasteful and minimal and plaintive named national songs that are all about the details that are all about the little things that elevate the songs above a template. And that's the thing, right, is that there's not that much difference between songs like Alphabet City uh, and Hornets and Coat on a Hook and Tour Manager from songs on first two pages. The difference is the attention to detail, the craft and the the way that these songs are animated by these details in a way that they seem to kind of shy away from with Frankenstein. So there's an analog, I think, with these two records of the creative process and of emboldening yourself as that process goes on there's a sense of trepidation and caution in first two pages a sense of like trying to sort of gently reconnect with a, a creative energy or or a, an emotional place that's difficult for you but is where your inspiration comes from and then with laugh track it's like they've stepped into that place and now there's Matt in particular is like totally animated by all the energies of that place, positive and negative, which is to say that there's a lot of anxiety in this album. There's a lot of paranoia in this album and songs like smoke detector in particular and songs like space invader and songs like turn off the house. There's an antsiness to this record that makes it feel very highly strung emotionally and kind of quite dramatic at certain points as well like space invader is a dramatic song and not just in the way that it crests to this massive post-rock finale but in the tension that's sizzling all the way through that alphabet city is a song that is a kind of humming high wire of tension for four minutes it opens the record in the suspended place of like you're waiting for something to drop and it never quite does but there's such beauty in that suspension and that state that the song exists within that it's just so rich and filled with these details. It's a gorgeous song. I absolutely love it. Deep end. Every time those guitars hit on that kind of chorus or on that sort of, not the chorus, on the verse of that song, that it's like breathing out. You know, there's this sense of, 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 of um, color and life flooding back into them. Weird Goodbyes, I've done such a 180 on this song. I remember when it was a single last year, I was like, this just feels like Nashville on autopilot. I wasn't really feeling it. I don't know whether they've changed it or whether I've just really gotten used to it, but I fucking love this song now. I fucking, I owe Morgan an apology. I remember Morgan said when we reviewed the last album right. that Weird Goodbyes was way better than the singles 
for first two pages and it was really annoying they left that song off i have come to agree because weird goodbyes has really grown on me i don't know whether it was something about putting this album on in the car and hearing just how fucking loud that synthetic beat is that opens the song it really fucking kicks from the gate even though the song is sort of more you know measured and slow in its pace there's still a lot of energy sizzling inside of it and the Bon Iver uh, backing vocals really add to the drama that the song accumulates, even though it's a fairly kind of like, you know, guilty party style song where it's like a very repetitive core motif that just goes on and on and on and slowly ramps up in the layers and intensity of it. Because that's just the song is basically just the, the chorus, you know, four or five times. But as it goes on, it gets slightly more intense to the point where you're really like, you don't realize how big the song has gotten until you're in those final stages of it. I love that. Uh, Dreaming, I think, is a, a stellar deep cut on this record. I love the kind of twinkling, slightly ghostly vocal effects that pop through in the song when Matt is singing the dreaming refrain. There's, it's just a beautiful little color and texture that none of the songs on you know, first two pages would have had a detail like that that really kind of changed the feel of it. Tour Manager, I think, is another underrated deep cut as well. It's maybe the most sparse song on the record, but there's a real, like, gentle devastation to the Play It Like It's Nothing Alice refrain. I, I, I just find it really, really affecting. Laugh Track. Okay, Jake, you've already talked about the title track on this record, and you said that it was kind of like the, the pinnacle. I don't remember your exact words, but you said something to the effect of it's kind of like the fullest version of this era of the national right it's the most like this era of the national type song but it's the best one of those and i completely agree right and it's, maybe it's the the phoebe feature that elevates it i mean the thing about the with the features on i don't think the features on the last record were underwhelming it's just that the songs weren't good enough you know with the exception of the taylor swift song which was one of the no it didn't the matter and the Taylor Swift song was one of the better songs on the record, so the feature felt good on that song because the song was good. Whereas, you know, the Phoebe features didn't really do much yeah. on first two pages, and it wasn't because the features weren't animated enough, just because the song, you know, wasn't that great. Whereas um, Laugh Track, the song here, is just one of the most cutting and great songs that Matt has written in several years. It's a template at this point, the kind of song that this is, you know, the our emotions for each other our connection within this relationship has deadened and now we're kind of it's all just performative it's all just playing out and we're just filling our role but that songwriting idea for a troubled relationship i don't know i feel like that the the metaphor that the song has the the setting for the song of, of being an actual performance in like a tv context with a laugh track and all these little illusions it, it feels like that those give this song a character and an identity that makes it rise above just the template of being another you know we're in a an emotionally difficult freezed out relationship how sad is that the writing just elevates this and it makes it better and the vocal melodies are so good too and, and phoebe phoebe's presence adds to how good those vocal melodies are i can't tell you like how many times since this album has come out that i've just been kind of laying there going i think our feet are gonna slip i think our hands are gonna shake i just doing that you know over and over and over it's such a great little earworm it's such a oh i love this song so much but i think the record saves its biggest surprises for the last two songs you know apart from space invader which we already knew wasn't a surprise because we had it as a pre-release single crumble the roseanne cash feature aside this feels like you know, the National have made songs in the vein of Crumble before, but they've never made a song that sounds like Crumble. They've never made a song that has this yeah. kind of like alt folky uh, Americana y like twist to it. It's subtle, but it, it is really there. It, it makes the song feel different. G genuinely it, does sound like Wilco. Like I was kind of flabbergasted by just how like off the deep end they went with that particular influence. Yeah, it's like, it's not full on Americana folk, but it's like adopting enough of that and fitting that into the world of this is a national song that it feels so refreshing. And then Smoke Detector, which, you know, Morgan made a comp to Murder Me Rachel and Sad Songs in general. I think that's absolutely the closest comp you can get. But really, I would say, I don't think they've ever made a song that's really quite like this. There's just nothing 
that feels as like ready to fully burst apart as smoke it's... detector like it feels dangerous in a way that their music doesn't really even in its most raucous and like that's something about the album that i really appreciated especially on re-listen because it does kind of feel like a moment of anxious swelling after just like like a perfect moment to release a sort of tension dispersal but never really like give you it sort of teases it out of you for the entire song and i feel like that's sort of what reinforced my feelings about this album and its relationship to the previous one is that smoke detector is basically thematically exactly what frankenstein was being in a macro sense but in one song and it's channeled into something that sounds completely unlike anything that they've ever made and that kind of really seals the deal on this record as a whole it's just like this is what we're doing and this is the step that forward that we're taking and it feels confident it feels new it feels assured but it still feels like them which makes it satisfying and also just like every time i finish this i'm like can someone Please check on my man, Matt Berninger. Well, I am I am the, fearful for his mind. The great thing about Smoke Detector, right, is it's the song, it's the kind of song that every national album needs, which is a song where the tension is released, where there's some sense of, of things boiling over, where there's some sense of this suspended malaise that the album exists in, that Matt's in throughout this album, in this place of, of you know, being depressed and in a haze where that actually has a kind of cathartic end point, you know, that leads to something as opposed to kind of just being this, you know, meaningless suspended state. I'm not saying a record can't be great without just being in that space, but for all of that tension, for all of that sense of unease that carries through songs like Hornets, Coat on a Hook. I mean, these are just songs about being uncomfortable. These are songs about being in a place and wanting to fucking get out of that place or mm -hmm. being in a relationship and feeling as though you can't even see the person in front of you because of this fog. <laughs> and that Matt Berninger said, I never want to be in a situation. <laughs> well, I mean, Smoke Detector is like a nightmare, right? It's like, it's, it's. Oh, yeah. It's what happens. It's the it's the fucking nightmare that happens after you go to sleep at the after the guy goes to sleep at the end of about today. This is what he dreams about. Ah, uh, uh, is this fuck alarms going off and just sheer chaos? A complete sense of of disconnection from reality. Blink and bless her. Let her rest. Don't let my memory dissolve. Make a list of your loved ones in order of height. Laugh at the blackbirds in the neck of the night. Forgive all the favorites in your phone. Imagine yourself completely alone. Called out there. Sit in the backyard uh, in my pharmacy slippers. At least I'm not on the roof anymore. And the closest song, I guess, that I can think of, just in terms of the um, the the kind of personality or or persona that matt has here is maybe like the sheer dissociative freeformness of not in kansas but the tone here is like where, where is that whereas not in kansas is like this kind of kaleidoscopic blink of an eye collapsing through all of your memories you know your childhood your your adolescence your growing up you know re remembering all of those things in one moment of total disconnection here is a moment of total dissociation where nothing makes sense, where nothing is familiar, where it's all of your worst moments, all of your worst anxieties, all of your fears just bubbling up into this complete, you know, nightmare, you know, to the point it, it, Matt has never sounded. Well, it's been a long time since I've heard Matt, Matt sound as genuinely creepy as he does towards the end of the song when he's just kind of limply mumbling you don't know how much i love you do you again and again as uh the band are just motoring forward with this sort of distant angsty thrum it's it's a really bizarre song and i have so much respect for including it on the album and making it the closer not to mention the fact that it's actually the longest national song ever <laughs> It's just they really want you to be suspended in this space. And it adds such a final twist to the album that honestly, every time I listen to it, and especially the first time I heard it, I didn't know what Smoke Detector was going to be. Hearing this close the album out, I immediately wanted to go and listen to the album again. Not just because, oh, it's a great national album and I listened to it a million times, but because Smoke yeah. Detector completely changes the frame 
with which you view the rest of the record. It's not just this, you know, sleepy stumbling through emotional disconnection. It's a genuine cry for help. It's a genuinely sort of despondent capturing of a really unhealthy way of living. And in that sense, it feels like the most uneasy national album ever. And I think a lot of its edge comes from that. Whereas first two pages of Frankenstein felt like sedated. I don't just mean in the sense that it was quiet. I mean, like it felt like taking a sedative and drifting off and having all of your anxieties and concerns sort of be forcibly melted away. Whereas here it's like that, this, that's worn off and you are back to reality and whoop, there goes gravity. Um, There's so many ways you could put, you could have put that and that was the one you chose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even the moments that I was a little bit chilly on initially, Songs like Hornets and Code on a Hook, I still think are the weaker moments in the record, particularly Hornets, which I haven't quite come around on yet. That one is the one that feels a little bit like the most derivative the record gets. And I do think there are moments where Matt's lyricism is kind of a little bit limp. Um, Like I'm not particularly a fan of the, I don't know if you're ever going to come back from your cigarette break. There's a few lines on some of these songs that just don't quite aren't quite up to snuff for me. And I, and I do feel the need to express that because I don't think this is a flawless album. But there's enough here for me to be fully on board with this. There's enough here for me to feel like this is basically the ideal album I would expect from the National at this stage of their career. I would not hold them to a standard higher than this after how much they have given us. I don't need yeah. another High Violet. I don't need another Alligator. I don't need another... I don't even need another fucking Sleep Well Beast. I don't need another record that I hold to that level of esteem. But if I can get records that I like as much as the Laugh Track fairly consistently from this band, then they will have thoroughly done their part. You know, Maybe even more than enough. The National have given us so much. And this is the thing is like when it's a favorite band and you have so many albums from them, you love, you are kind of more, you're kind of more unfair to them in a certain sense, because you're like, I need Yeah, Morgan made that point last video. Yeah. And now it's like a kind of resolution to that point because it's like, I'm grateful they had this and then I'm grateful they put this out. I will happily, you know, wade through and justify any number of first two pages of Frankensteins, as long as I can get an equal number of laugh tracks, you know, I I will happily put up with that balance. Well, that brings us to the end of our conversation today about the new albums from Mitski and the national. Let us know where you fall on each of these albums. What do you think of the Mitski record? Where do you think it ranks in her catalog so far? How do you think it compares to her previous albums? Let us know in the comments below. If you've come for the national review, let us know what you think of laugh track, how you think it compares to Frankenstein, where you think it fits in the nationals catalog. If you're that as into it as we are, or maybe if you're not, let us know in the comments below. Let's continue the conversation down there. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly for just $1 a month, you can hit the join button on our channel page, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, get your name and the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and talk about on one of our now episodes, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Disneyland, the happiest place on earth.